Welcome to the MediaCasters with your business besties, Karina Belizzi and Julie Loken. In every episode, you'll get behind the scenes access to experts who share their struggles and successes in podcasting, publishing, and presenting. So grab a pen, grab your bestie, and kick it with Karina and Jules. Wow, well, we're here. We're kicking it. Who are we with? This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get to talk to Tom Langen, who we know from the world of Clubhouse, and I have had the opportunity to be in some of the rooms he hosted because Julie brought me in. So Julie, tell us about Tom. Tom Langen is an Emmy-nominated producer. He, I, he when, the first time I talked to him, because I have a little bit of intimidation talking to him, <laughs> just because of my video, and you probably can see right here, but he gave me some great tips, and I think maybe he can give us some great tips today as well meaning have under lights behind you which i still haven't done but i'm going to do it but i mean even his background right now here on our telecast our broadcast is it's beautiful and one thing i remember him telling me was that those fake back oh sorry karina those fake backgrounds don't do them <laughs> <laughs> yep. And I use them religiously because what I host a few podcasts and it helps me keep my head on straight. Which one am I talking about now? Oh, right. The media casters. Well, it's I good also have young new. children who make big messes in my office. And so the desk behind me is covered in paint and whatever else. Nobody needs to see that. I, I do. It makes me feel better. <laughs> For, it makes me, it validates me as a mother is what it does. <laughs> Right, I'm sure. Well, Tom, I don't know if you have a four and a seven year old running around to destroy your office, but what you have there is absolutely beautiful. I I don't. Thanks, uh, Karina Jules. It's good to see you as always. Um, yeah, I I don't have a four and seven year old uh, running around in my office. Uh, we don't have any kids in the house. We do have three dogs, uh, but they're uh, they're pretty good about not knocking things over, which is good because the cameras that are sitting behind me are not. Uh, inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I'm glad that they haven't knocked that table over. But uh, but yeah, I mean, it, I get asked, I actually have a lot of people ask me if my background is real uh, when they mm -hmm. first see me. So the the thing I do, like the the move that I do all the time is I'll take <gasps> I'll take my water bottle and I'll just okay. put it on the shelf behind me. <laughs> wow, that's like magic. And, it's because and of your high focus because your camera is obviously really nice too. So you've got that yeah. sharp focus on you and the back is kind of faded into the background. And so many people now use these blurred backgrounds that mm -hmm. um, it just looks like, yeah, I could get that. It looks like it must be artificial. Be <laughs> what, what is that behind you? Those are cameras? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So people, uh, I, I get that question a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and, and my thing with like the, with the virtual backgrounds um, is is that I find yours is doing a good job because you do you you mentioned uh, before we we came on live you mentioned that you do have a green screen behind you that you use so mm -hmm. yours is actually doing a better job than most but the thing is that I find them to be more distracting than beneficial a lot of the time mm -hmm. yep I agree um, with you I do because people's would, faces are is, disappearing yeah. People's they have faces, part of their ears gone. <laughs> yeah, their hands, they're <laughs> their gesturing, arms. they're talking with their hands, and their hands disappear. And and what you're doing, like our our natural instinct, right? I mean, like it or not, whether you you choose to be vegetarian or vegan or omnivorous, we are as an animal, we are predators, right? As a species of animals, we are predators, right? It's why we have binocular vision. But one of the things is that our binocular vision is designed to key in on movement. Right. It's we are programmed to to focus on movement when we see it. And so what happens is when people are moving around and like their hands are disappearing in and out of virtual backgrounds, everybody's eyes are on their hands and they're not on their face. They're not paying attention to facial expressions. They're losing focus on what the person is saying. So if you're trying to say something of import, um, I think you're always better off to have a less distracting background rather than popping in and out of the virtual background. And that's kind of why I, t I generally give that advice. I agree. So I do think though that mine is okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. It's better. It, it is better than the vast majority of them 
that I uh, that I see. And that's because you've made that intentional choice of putting the green screen up. Right. And actually putting a little thought and effort into using it rather than just clicking a button on Zoom or whatever your right. your video conferencing software of choice is and and counting on that to just kind of magically do everything. Well, and I think that we need to think about not only what our system looks like, but how we sound. And so I've done a bit of work in my home office to really reduce the sound as much as possible. I have curtains now up to help dampen the big window sound, mm -hmm. just so yep. there's less reflective surfaces. I have sound paneling up um, behind my computer screen over there. And then you know, this, the green screen itself is dual layer. So one side is green and the other is blue because I sometimes have to shift it based on what I'm wearing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, ultimately, it's it provides some sound dampening as well. So mm -hmm. we produce better sound. Your podcast is going to sound better. Your experience on Clubhouse is going to sound better. So, I mean, a lot of the questions I have for you around the tech you're using, because you do such an incredible job. His of voice live sounds like butter, right? Yeah, it sounds like butter. And mm -hmm. he's got, you know, when he goes on Clubhouse for those sessions and he's posting them on LinkedIn, I mean, visually, it looks great because you can actually see the screen of somebody like holding an iPhone, with who's talking and who's live and all that jazz. So I think you're just doing a really good job of getting your message into the world mm -hmm. using the technology of today. And, you know, Thank that's you. something we can all continually improve on, especially as new tech becomes available. But I just love for you to kind of run through what it is you're using and why you like it. <laughs> so um the camera setup that i use is so i i do a couple of things so first of all the camera that i use is a a full frame mirrorless camera uh it's what i use for my webcam it's a camera that i already owned so uh it's a sony a7 III um and then on on that camera i have a sigma art uh 35 millimeter um f 1.4 lens so the camera and the lens combination is like you know a few thousand dollars but it's equipment because i'm in video production it's equipment i already owned right so i i wasn't it wasn't that i was like i i went out and bought this specifically although i probably would have bought something similar to be perfectly honest um if i didn't own something appropriate uh, I swear, Julie, but, this man's after my own heart here. The tech geek in me is singing. But uh, I have not made yeah, those investments. I, I literally have nothing to say except that I, I have something just nonchalant that has nothing to do with tech to say. But it, it's like when Harry met Sally today, when Karina yeah. met Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, my husband has a very nice high tech camera that he doesn't let me use for. Did he have you like a this. camera? Oh, and what do you do when you have like background eyes? My son is here and I told him somebody to wants a burrito. Yeah. yeah, it's my son. And you know, what's better than just us being on here, having my 13 year old on and he won't because he'd be, well, does he want to join us? Does he want to be a part <laughs> of the conversation? Today? Next talk about, he, he would talk love about the uh, technology of podcasting and video casting. And he's knocking over the camera right now. Hi, so. Benjamin. No, it's Gwen. <laughs> Gwen. Okay. <laughs> we love these things. And especially when we're having a serious com conversation about technology, you come over here. Right. And go. Yeah. Sit down and join us or, or see you later. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so yeah, so, so that's what I use for the camera and that's how I'm able to achieve what I'm able to achieve in terms of having that very sort of soft out of focus background is because uh, I'm using a very fast prime lens, um, kind of wide open with the aperture wide open, right? And that's what gives that shallow depth of focus. Um, the way for for anybody, I you know, th this may help for anybody who's not who doesn't really understand what I mean by depth of focus. The way I like to explain that to people is to think of it like a pane of glass, right? So the the lower the number of an aperture on a lens, right? the thinner the pane of glass is. And then when you turn the focus ring on the lens, you're moving that pane of glass closer and further away from the camera, right? So right now the pane of glass is right here, at like my eyes. But if I move my hand in, it's, it's not in line with the pane of glass anymore. Now it's out of focus. And if you look really closely, my eyes are in focus. My ears are slightly out of focus, right? Because the aperture is so wide open, 
that pane of glass is very thin. But mm -hmm. if I were to then go and turn that aperture down and close down the aperture on the lens, make that number go up. So if I turned it up to like an F8, that pane of glass goes from being like one, one thickness of a regular pane of glass, like an eighth of an inch to like a foot thick. Wow. And so, then same thing that moves in, in and out uh, as you turn that focus ring. And you're using a video camera as opposed to just a everyday Joe Schmo camera. It's a, well, the camera, it's a, it's a Sony a seven three. So it's a full frame mirrorless. Uh, what does mirrorless mean? I don't even camera. really know that. So if you heard SL, you've heard SLR, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So SLR cameras have a mirror. So when you look through the viewfinder on an SLR camera, what you're actually looking at is a mirror. So it, you, you're looking at a mirror that then it's sort of, it's sort of like a periscope, yeah. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. And that mirror that's is, is behind the lens and in front of where the film goes or where the sensor is and a digital SLR that mirror, when you click the shutter button, if you are still looking through the viewfinder, the viewfinder goes black for a second, right? Mm -hmm. And what that is, is that's, that mirror mechanically moves up so that you can expose the film or the sensor to the light coming through the lens. And then it goes back down and oh. closes off the light. So, so basically mirrorless means it just doesn't have that mirror. And when you look through the viewfinder, what you're actually looking at is a little tiny digital screen right? That is showing you what the sensor is seeing. So the sensor is sort of continually exposed to the light coming through the lens. Mm. Okay. And, Interesting. Yeah. And the, and the, the thing that's cool about that, if, if I can super nerd out for a second, <laughs> um, the, cause I wasn't, I wasn't super nerding out. That was just regular, like wow. regular standard time. nerd. If I get super nerdy, the cool thing about that is like, I need to, I'm calling you after we record. <laughs> yeah. Right. No. The cool thing about that is mirrorless cameras put the sensor really close to the, the back of the lens, right? What's called the flange on the back of the lens, which is where the lens attaches to the camera. So because of that shallow flange depth, the depth, the distance between the sensor and the lens, you can then put a whole wide variety of different kind of lenses on that camera and get an adapter ring that basically just moves the lens the proper distance out to work with that sensor. So like you can put Canon lenses on it. You can put uh -huh. Nikon lenses on it. You can put Sony lenses on it. You can put old, I have a, I have a set of old uh, Pentax like antique lenses from like the late seventies, early eighties um, that I can put on any of these cameras. And it's because of the shallow flange depth from having that sensor really close to the back of the lens. That's so interesting. You know, I, you'll like this story, Tom, on a morning walk around oh my, my complex, I went around 1440 multiversity, which is right up by my house. And Jules and I are talking about hosting an event there pretty soon. It's just this incredible, beautiful conference center in the Redwoods. And when they were going through their final construction phase, when they shifted it from being a, um, rundown Christian university that was like basically falling apart to its present state. There were so many people coming through doing work that um, you just saw a continual shift of things like construction vehicles, cars coming in and out, survey, whatever. Right. So one day I'm on this walk and it had just rained and I'm like, is that a camera lens under that bush right there? Now, I'm not just talking any camera lens. It ends up being a very high-end Canon macro lens. Like, okay. It's at least $1,000. It's in perfect condition, missing the lens cap. It was just a little bit damp. We put a listing out in our local community to say, hey, you know, uh, we found this lens. Um, nobody claimed it. We reached out to the university. Nobody claimed it. So now my husband has a really nice macro lens that nice. happens to fit on his Canon, his Canon, which is um, an SLR. But, you know, yeah, it nice. happens to fit. I, I like the idea of having an adapter ring to go take any lens and put it on that camera. That's really, that actually makes it much more functional because people get so locked in to a specific brand. They have a Sony this or a Canon that. So, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I can use lenses from you know, most manufacturers. Um, yeah. 
because of the because of that flange depth so mm -hmm. so yeah so it's kind of nerdy but very practical too Good. Jules is like, no, not nerdy at all. I'll just no. sit here and listen to these people. It's like not them. nerdy, but you lost me at flange, really. <laughs> but, but I always have to play the devil's advocate, if you will. And, you know, it's fun when my son's running around and I, I love the realness of it. But the truth <laughs> is, is that what is the realness of our objective with video? And I know over COVID personally, when you cannot have that in-person interaction, video was the next best thing. Mm -hmm. And I I started harnessing it, it even though I didn't particularly, particularly like being in front of the camera. Like, not so much. But I know that my clients and my audience, they wanted to see me. They wanted to feel like I was in touch with what they're talking about. And that's what you do. So what can regular Joes, not tech, tech nerds or, you know, people that understand what flange means, what can we do if it is on Facebook or social media? What is your go-to just for regular people like me? So if, if we're talking about, uh, so two things, right? If we're talking about like web camera, presence right and we're talking about like video conferencing and stuff like that my uh my go-to tip uh is to make sure because so many people do this you guys have both are, are both doing a great job at not making this mistake um but so many people make this mistake and that's their their laptop is sitting on their desk and they just move they tilt the monitor back and forth to get the camera, get their face in, in frame. And then the camera is just pointing up their nose. Right. Um, and it's, it's not a flattering angle. Uh, and nobody wants to, nobody wants to look at you like that. Right. And then you're ending up no matter what you do for the person on the other end of it, it feels like you're talking down at them. Right. Because the camera is so under, so far underneath you. So the number one tip is simple, simple thing. You don't need anything fancy. If you got a couple of boxes kicking around, you can do this. Right. Raise your laptop. Right. If you're using your laptop camera, raise your laptop up, get it up off of your desk and get the camera just above eye level. Right. Not not like raise it six inches, get that camera. So it is actually, if you're sitting up straight and looking straight ahead, it is just above your eye level. You want that camera to be kind of like equal with like the middle of your forehead, right? And then you'll be, you'll naturally, as you sit there and look at that camera, you'll tilt your chin up a little bit, right? It'll help elongate your neck. It'll help create some definition around your jawline, right? And then all of a sudden, you look like a totally different person than, you know, like, you know, other, you know, when you're looking like that, like I look like a, a pelican who's like just <laughs> swallowed a big fish, right? Like well, this, this is where some manufacturers, you know, some manufacturers of new laptops, they even put the camera literally at the base, which is just a wrong spot for it. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. It should be if, a top line really. Yeah. And if that's the situation you're dealing with, I recommend they were out of stock at the beginning of the pandemic. You can get them now Buy yourself, spend 40, 50 bucks, buy yourself a decent web camera and put it on top of your monitor. Right. Yeah, and that's what I um, have here. Like, there it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just above my eye level a little bit. But um, what I find that's somewhat frustrating by not working with something as nice as what you've got is that it, tries to color balance like you just saw like mm. i put my hand out here and it's trying to like adjust things and yeah. it makes it the light come in and out so it's not perfect by any no. stretch of the imagination and if i one day have a studio set up like your own perhaps i'm not sharing with my children or whatever else <laughs> well um, we're gonna have a studio karina you yeah then i mean uh, it's it's an aspiration it's a hope because really that's when you can start to create really good quality videos that people want to watch on YouTube, right? Yeah. Well, and when you guys, so, so yes, you know, I think I always encourage people to just start, right? I think there's a lot of people look at, 
you know, they look at their favorite YouTubers, right? Or their favorite content creators who have maybe been creating content for five, 10, 15 years, right? They look at them and they're like, I can't do what they're doing. So I'm just not going to do anything. And if you go back, if you go back to any of your favorite YouTube channels, I would like, I would suggest anybody listening, do this, right? Go to one of your favorite YouTube channels and go to the very first videos that they posted on that channel, right? And watch them. Mm -hmm. And I promise you that the production value is much lower than what you're watching today. If they've been around for a while, the production value, and they are not as good on camera 10 years ago in those first videos as they are in the ones that they do today. Right. Because like one of our favorite phrases, it, practice makes improvement, right? So they've got tons of practice. They've got years of doing this. They've managed to up their production value as they've grown their business and been able to afford better equipment and learned what to buy and how to set things up, right? Or hired people to do that for them. Um, and they've also improved the way they present on camera because that's an acquired skill set. So, so just get started. So long as your intention is and you're creating content that's designed to accomplish a goal, I usually suggest start with delivering value to your audience, right? If your content is designed to deliver value to your audience, they will forgive a lot early on, right? And the, the number one thing, though, is, is, is actually audio over visual, right? Mm -hmm. They've done research and they found that people will turn off a video that sounds bad faster than they will turn off a video that doesn't look good but sounds fine right? So make sure that you are intelligible, that you're easy to hear, that people can understand what you're saying, right? So like spend a couple of bucks, get a microphone, right? Maybe as your first purchase and then upgrade your camera. I, I agree completely. I mean, this is one of my beefs with Clubhouse because you'll be in a room and somebody has really good sounding audio like yourself or what I've now worked to do by stitching together my setup with club deck and then being in that space or even on the wisdom app and somebody comes in and their audio is just like in and out and garbled and hard to understand. It just makes it a difficult listening experience. And that's when, you know, people stop listening. So mm -hmm. I just think um, it's, it's powerful. This, the reason that we've had this kind of audio revolution with social audio, as well as through podcasting is because the power of our voices actually connects people. You feel like you develop a relationship with someone that you're listening to, especially when you're given a peek into their their lives and their perspectives and the way in which we're sharing our voices today, as opposed to just being some highly produced TV show that may have made people seem further from you, so to speak. Right. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And there's, you know, like if you've got a smartphone with a decent camera, spend 30 bucks get a little add on microphone for that. And now you can start creating content, right? Like you can get a can't like you can get a little microphone that plugs into the lightning port. If you have an iPhone that plugs into the bottom of your iPhone, right? That's a pre it's a halfway decent little microphone, little shotgun microphone. Um, and you can be off to the races creating content that sounds markedly better than it would if without that microphone. Right. Yeah. And, mm. and that's enough to get going. And even in my earlier days when I was doing that for um, some just small little videos I was making for Instagram, whatnot, I would just use my Plantronics earbud. It's nothing that incredible, but if it was mated with that, the audio quality was better than if I just had it on speakerphone or whatever. Right. And yeah. using this device, it wasn't super visible. My hair would cover it, but I would get a better quality sound than if I was just relying on the phone itself. So, yeah. you know, use what you have first, like to your point, but a small investment can make a really big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can get uh, like a better microphone for your phone for like 30 bucks. Yeah. Android or Apple. Doesn't matter. Both. They have them for both. Both. Mm -hmm. Well, no, I'm asking. I Actually, the question came out wrong. Tom, which do you prefer, Android or Apple? Oh, no, oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm 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 an Apple user. Uh, I 
That's that's mm-hmm. due to a couple of things. One is I grew up uh, at sc- the school I went to when I was a kid, when I was first introduced to computers, um, we had Apple two E's, I think they were. Um, but, uh, but that those Macintosh computers were the first computers that I ever really used. Mm -hmm. So that was what I was comfortable with. It was also what my college used. So when I went away to college and I got a computer in college, it was a Macintosh because that was the, that was the computer system that my college used. Um, and so it was an Apple product. And so I've just always, I've had a couple of PCs after college and then I ended up going back to Apple. Um, I just like the experience, the user interface, the user experience, I think is better on Apple products. And so that's what I use. Um, but, uh, but I'm not like, I'm not a, uh, it's gotta be Apple or. Someone's uh, agreeing with you, Tom, live yep. in our audience. Yep. Plitsky, yes. Apple 2E. We have. Yeah. The Apple 2E. Winner. Um, yeah. Yeah. With well, the- I've had an Apple back in those days too, but I'm a full convert to the world of PCs and Androids because I was so frustrated with Apple. I, I, I'm in, I went to high school in Cupertino, so I've been in this area for a long, long time. And I'll just tell you, um, after my third or fourth iPhone failed, like just the switch on the side broke. Remember when they had the switch? I was mm-hmm. like, this, I'm so sick of this. I'm so sick of having to go and like- We're going have- old school now, like a switch. What? Yeah, they had a switch. It has a switch on the side. But I'm talking, I had five in my history. I I had five iPhones, but just over a very relatively short period of time because they kept failing on me. And at that time, Apple was running this um, advertising campaign. If you don't have an iPhone, you don't have an iPhone. And it was so pretentious and got me so pissed. But I was like, screw this. I'm not going to have another iPhone. I'm done with you guys. Karina can I, get really pissed, yes, too. I can. She's, very, she's very adamant about her beliefs. <laughs> and so I've been on Android ever since. And what I'll say is my Samsung Galaxy S9, like an S9, they have a 20 now. That This is five years old, and it still works perfectly. Wow. I have not ever had an Apple iPhone last longer than... Don't drop it in the pool, girl. I mm. feel like they make phones now, like washing machines and dryers that only last two years. Matt, that's right. What's What's funny is I've never... I, I've had the opposite experience. I've never had an iPhone break. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just... I don't know, the curse in a way. But I worked for years for a company that everything at the company was on Apple. And hmm. so that was all I used for a long time. And now I, I my laptop is a Mac Surface Pro. Um, I love it. I'm sorry, not a Mac. It was Microsoft, right? Like say right. that word. Microsoft, yeah, Surface the Pro. Surface Pro. I love it. And it does a great job for me. It's super portable. Also is a tablet. And... I can use a stylus on it, do whatever I need to. And I have a ginormous PC at home that my husband's constantly adding more memory to because I keep producing content. <laughs> and the fact that I can just keep adding memory and it doesn't cost me that much to fix and keep upgrading is is really incredible. So we can we yeah. can have the PC Apple war anytime here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I it it all I mean, I I have a uh I have a I have a I'm running mac os on a computer right now that i'm sitting in front of the one that i'm using to talk to you guys uh and that's a computer that i built mm-hmm. wow. um so i'm around smart and then people I, everybody i'm around a lot of smart people listen i i am not a computer scientist by any stretch of the imagination I watched a lot of YouTube tutorials and read mm-hmm. a lot of forums and guides on how to do it. So like I am not I am not some kind of like computer genius by any stretch of the imagination. I just followed directions. Yeah. Well, my husband's a networking engineer and so he works for Joby Aviation. They like they're going to make us fly like the Jetsons in the future to any spot we want to go without sounding like a giant helicopter is going everywhere but um we have a network rack over there that is it could operate a small business (laughs) out of my home just with we could see your background we would see what you're talking about yeah well and then and then like meanwhile i have like stacks of hard drives yeah what the heck i don't even know who i'm talking to anymore (laughs) i'm like in the twilight zone i'm just like well because i need everything because of all the content that I produce for clients, right? Like I have to have everything 
like I have to have duplicate backups of all of it, right? Yep. Right so, array and all that jazz. Yep. Yeah. So I edit off of a, a 16, uh, 16 terabyte oh, raid oh array. Karina, can you translate for me? And then I, I mean, I have, I probably have a hundred terabytes of storage in my office right now. That sounds so, like a lot. Just to give you an idea, yeah, you know, 16 um, terabyte RAID array, it's like you take two drives and they're mirroring each other. Each of them is 16 terabytes, correct? You're not doing eight and eight, it's 16 and 16. I feel like no, I don't it's, belong it, in It's eight and eight. Thing. It's okay. a, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's a RAID zero. Right. Um, yeah. So array. it's a hundred percent duplicate drive so that if you have failure, you have backup. And that's just critical for anybody who's, spending all that time, energy, and effort on their visual media, because if you lose it, you lose it. <laughs> and you need to have that for your clients. You need to have that uh, available. And what I would liken this to from a professional perspective is like, if you go scuba diving, you want to have a fail safe, you want to have a backup, because if you go down and you have an issue, what are you going to do? So we all have I'm, you're putting me on solo. <laughs> She's making fun of me now. <laughs> um, but you 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 have to have a backup octo, right? So you have your backup right. breathing device because you don't want to completely fail. It's the same concept. But this yeah. is why I hire people. I'm just saying. And I have I have you know like all the, like those drives I just held up. Like these are these are four terabyte drives. Whoops, I don't know how to. Get and uh, <laughs> <laughs> She's playing with me. I these wanted are, to get Tom. Are, up in front so we can see him holding up his yeah, yeah these this. are these oh, are yeah. four terabyte drives and i've got a whole bunch of them but these i use for backups and then my my raid array is actually raid zero array there there are a bunch of different ways to do raid arrays and so like you can set up a raid array so that it creates a duplicate what i've done with mine is i have two eight terabyte drives and uh i've set them up so that the computer treats them as one drive. And so what that means is it can write to both drives simultaneously. And so it, it effectively dramatically increases the speed at which it can read and write from the drives. Right. So it's sort of like, think of it like it, it pulls individual streams of data and then merges them into the same stream as it, uh, in both directions. So like as it's sending information to the drives and pulling information off the drives, it can do it much faster because it's, it's not pulling all the information from one drive. It's pulling part of it from one drive and part of it from the other drive. So it effectively speeds everything up. So that's why I have that read zero set up, um, for that. But then I have like terabytes and terabytes of backup drives. So every project that's on that read zero, uh, drive that read zero array, is backed up in duplicate on other drives so that if that raid array ever goes down, I can replace it, pull up the the backup and just be right back where I was. Have you ever had a complete failure when you were recording and, and had to tr go back and do over? Has that ever occurred? <laughs> Uh, I have knock on wood, which I will, my desk is actually made out of wood. So I'll knock on that. Um, knock on wood. I've never had a drive fail in the middle of like recording something or anything like that. I've had, uh, I've had drives fail when I'm backing up footage on location. Hmm. Um, I just actually had that happen, uh, last month up in Boston, uh, at MIT, uh, working on a project up there. So I had a drive, a backup drive fail while I was backing up data, but, uh, we we're fortunate enough that it was a short enough project that I had enough media with me, uh, so I could keep it on the camera and on one backup drive. So it was in two places hmm. and that's sort of the golden rules. You always want to have a copy, uh, somewhere else. Um, so yeah, so, I, I have had drives fail. It happens. Um, yeah. But the drives that I buy are all, uh, they're all designed for industrial use. Um, so they're actually server drives is what they're designed for. So they're designed to run constantly. Um, and so you get much better life out of them than like consumer, uh, standard consumer drives. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Well, I know speaking network engineering now. I know Karina is going to be calling you <laughs> this afternoon after this recording because first of all, we're just like we're bedazzled by everything that you're doing. Every single live you do, you do it with it looks like with such ease, but it's done with a professional eye. So Tom, you are amazing. And I know there's so many more questions that Karina could probably could ask you because I'm like, I just want to say, like, how do you do a reel? That would be my question. But Karina's like the technical meg oh. megahertz. Da -da -da. Let's, I, let's talk about that. You want to talk about it? Like she sighed. <laughs> I'll talk, talk about, about anything, it. but you do such an amazing job. And I, I think I just want to learn a little bit about your past because I've dove into it just a little bit you're an emmy nominated producer tell us like where how, how that happened well, so i'll give you i'll give you the nickel uh the nickel bio um or the nickel tour of my my background uh just to i always find that helps helps people understand sort of how i ended up doing what i do now who are you came. and why are you yeah here? exactly who am i why am i here uh well i'm here because you invited me but i'll tell you who i am um, so I started out in, uh, in production in the entertainment industry in 2001. Um, and so essentially what happened, and it was by accident. So what happened was I was a psychology major in college and I didn't want to go to graduate school. And my parents said, okay, fine. Uh, but when you graduate and you come back to New York, um, and move back into our house, uh, you better get a job. Right. So it wasn't it wasn't like we're going to charge you rent, but it was mm, you're not going to live here for free and just hang out and and eat our food and and, you know, live in our house. You, you got to get a job. That was the deal. So get to March of my senior year in college and my uh, I was on the phone with a good friend of mine from high school and, uh, you know, was telling her that my parents were starting to get on my case about getting a job when I graduate in May. And she said, well, why don't you call my dad? And I was like, why would I call your dad? And she said, well, he, you know, he works in TV. And I was like, yeah, I know he works in TV. And she said, well, he's, he's starting a new show and he's going to need PAs, production assistants. And it's an entry level job. Uh, it doesn't pay very much, but you don't need, I was like, I didn't study film or production or communication. She's like, you don't need to, it's entry level. Like, you're smart enough. You've got a pulse. Like you can show up on time. You can do the job. It's no big deal. Just call him if you're interested. And I said, okay. So I called him and he hired me for an entry level job. And I was the guy, uh, you know, I started six days after I graduated from college and I was the guy who was, you know, taking coffee orders and getting lunch for everybody and, and whatever needed to be done. I was running errands. Um, and, uh, ended up enjoying myself despite, uh, the sort of humble beginnings of that career and spent, ended up spending 17 years in the entertainment industry. Um, and I worked my way up starting as a production assistant and ended up as a showrunner and series producer where I was overseeing, um, the full production of episodic, uh, television series for, uh, television networks. Um, and then, uh, about three and a half years ago, I decided that it was time for a change and, uh, I decided to leave the entertainment uh, industry and uh, open Talix Media and start working with businesses to help change the way and improve the way they communicate with the communities that they seek to serve. Because um, that's what I'm really passionate about is about telling stories and helping people communicate more effectively. Um, and uh, and so yeah, so I started I started Talix Media about three and a half years ago, and and that was basically when I decided it was kind of after I'd already decided to p start extracting myself from the entertainment industry um, was when I was, I worked on a project called her big idea, um, which was uh, where we were telling the stories of female entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs in uh, near in and around New York city who, and telling the stories of how they started their businesses. That was, that was what the, the show was all about. And that was the show uh, where we got the Emmy nomination. So, um, so yeah, so I got nominated twice, uh, for that show, unfortunately didn't win. The show ended up winning in a different category, but I was not included on that nomination because I didn't work on those episodes. Um, so the show won an Emmy. I didn't win an Emmy. 
uh, but you know, definitely, uh, definitely proud of the fact that that we were recognized nonetheless. And uh, and yeah, so that's uh, that's how I ended up here. Is uh, is is you know, spending seventeen years in the uh, in the entertainment industry and and uh, decided to put that skill set to use helping businesses. Well, they need help, and I'm sure we need help too. So I was going to say we need, need help. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're talking about doing um, an event at a conference center that could be quite mm -hmm. large and, mm -hmm. you know, getting video together and doing all sorts of things there. So well, it's called there, Tom. Yeah. Dial. You know, just make sure that we get the right setup and the right mm -hmm. content, produce something worthy of a, I don't know, a lister podcast one day. But it's all about connection. There you go. It's all about connecting. And we, we are so happy we connected with Tom today. Tom's amazing. If you haven't noticed, even if you didn't understand all everything he was explaining, just play <laughs> this episode again. And Karina will call Karina because she'll translate it for you. <laughs> and then I'll tell you how to get the $30 fix to get you through. Or, you know, even just when you're upgrading your audio, shifting to something like my, oh my God, here she Zoom goes again. Track She's before, which, out on us. She's I mean, I out. know is just it's low grade. And so far as much of the equipment I'm sure that you have, but ultimately meant that I could produce quality audio on things like the wisdom app and, right. you know, connect my microphone to that stuff. And, and yeah. if you haven't been on the wisdom app, out, well, we got to talk to you about that yeah. afterwards, but you know, I just, I like all the technology, I think we'll put some everything in the notes so you guys can, understand what Tom and Karina are talking about. And I'm going to be reading those show notes as well. So don't you worry. You well, have and to, then I'm taking this thing to PodFest next week so that we can yeah. record while we're there. Portable, small enough to go in your purse. It means that you can record on the go. So that will be really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Zoom makes some great products. Yeah. And the For portable, sure. durable enough, you know, Here they I go just, again, yeah. guys. I tried. To, I know. Like, I know. I'll stop. I'll stop. We'll just ask him to say the two. Oh words. my God. We should do like a tech show just totally on tech. I think just a tech episode. Yeah. Because for people like me who don't understand what you're talking about. But what I understand is that we've got Tom Lang in here. He's amazing. He is like a true gentleman and he is, he's not about himself. He's offering help and service and make sure you check all about him in our show notes. But before we leave Karina, what do we always say? And because Tom's listened to every single episode here of the media oh, cast. No, we don't have to tell him, right? Yeah, we don't. It's like what a secret say it, say it, say it, Tom. He has no idea. Didn't you ask Dom? <laughs> I did not. I did not. I should have. Yes. <laughs> I should have. Apparently. We, we ask all words. of our guests to say two words before they leave. Kick okay. It. Kick, Kick it. it. All right. Wait, no, no, that wasn't very good. Tom. So, so, no, 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 so, no, that wasn't very good, Tom. No, 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 I know. I'm, I'm just like, what I, I, what pops into my head when I hear those two words are, are the Beastie Boys. That's, that's right. Oh, we love the Beastie Boys here. Right. Like, that's mm -hmm. what pops into my head. God, can we play the Beastie Boys right now? Oh, I wish. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, you can't. But, yeah, but that's what I well, totally, that's what I envision. <laughs> yeah, so in my mind, I hear, kick it! And then- it, Yes, yeah. that was great! Wait, 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 wait. That's it. Kick it! Da, na, 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 na. Yeah. I'm yeah, we need the licensing rights to that. Whoa. Wait, say kick it, though. You did a great job at kick You it. want me to do it one more time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. one more time. You need quiet. Okay. Quiet on the set. Quiet on the set. Kick it! That was- da, really na, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tom. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you both. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for uh, listening to my diatribe on uh, technical information. Actually, one more tip I want to leave everybody with, right? So if you're recording content on your phone, turn on the grid lines, right? The grid lines on your phone, they're there for a reason, Turn them on. Lines. Turn them on in the photos app, in the camera app on your phone, whether it's an, an Android or an iPhone, it'll have a, an, an option to turn on grid lines. Turn them on and use them. And here's how you use them, right? So it basically turns your phone screen into like a tic-tac-toe board, right? Mm -hmm. And what you want to do 
is whatever you want people to focus on, whatever the focus of your image, whether it's video or still photography, whatever the focus of your image is, put it on one of the grid lines, right? Or on one of the intersections, those four points where they intersect. And, and what that enables you to do is follow something that's called the rule of thirds, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it will instantaneously make your images more appealing visually to the people looking at them. Yep. Right. 100%. So anybody so who's any art history, that's right. Yep. The rule yep. of thirds. Can we call things. you next week when we're at, at PodFest together and we need some pictures and some advice? Absolutely. You can, you can reach out anytime. You know that. <laughs> Thanks know so much, Tom. Tom. Tom, let's kick it. Let's kick it. <laughs> let's kick it. Oh, you're good at that. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Media Casters. You can keep this conversation going and kick it with Karina and Jules in live office hours each week. Visit themediacasters.mn.co to sign up. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe whenever you listen. Let's kick it.